There are secrets out there, guys, performance marketing secrets, and knowing just one or two of them can absolutely light up your funnels. Let's go. This is the Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your host, Chris Mechanic. Join me as I uncover the secrets of the world's most elite CMOs marketing leaders. The Revenue Driven CMO is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the AI-driven performance agency that makes you smarter. I think the biggest secret out there is nobody really knows. Um, People that are on the inside and think they know, um, you know, they only kind of have inklings of what they're building and where they think they need to head. Um, and I think that's a really interesting, you know, kind of secret that's in the marketplace is nobody really knowing about where cookie list advertising is, is going. And the reason I, I mentioned that is, you know, I have a huge player in the space in Google. Um, and they've gone through three, some could argue four iterations of what their next solution is going to be when it comes to this stuff. Um, and, the no- and the next piece of news that you get is it's delayed. Nope, we got to reiterate. We got to move forward. And then you hear, you know, all the non-Google folks, right? The SSPs, the trade desks of the world, the Epsilons, all the data companies, and they're building something and they think they have a good solution. But until Google pushes that button, they don't really need their solution. And oh, I, I so think you're saying really not even Google knows. I thought you meant like the average brand or the average advertiser, but you're saying Google doesn't even know. I mean, I think just to put a blanket on everybody, there might be about seven or eight people that are sitting inside of the walls of Google and think they're really onto something. And now they got to figure out how they can commercialize it and expand it out globally. Uh, But yeah, I I think generally, you know, everybody's kind of looking at Google for what's going to come next. You know, it was ads data hub and then it was flock and then it was topics. And that was supposed to happen right now. Like, you know, two years ago, we heard, you know, fall 2022, it's over. Right. And, and in July we heard, "Eh." maybe it's over later, right? So I I really think that a lot of folks just don't quite know. And again, the other part that's hard about this is if you're building an alternative cookie list solution, it's not going to matter until Google, who has the biggest user ID network on the planet, actually shuts that down because their solution that you're still able to use is probably going to be better than whatever your alternative is that you're building to that. So I think it's a really interesting proposition. So. For the folks that may not be, you know, that uh, up to speed or that in tune with this particular topic, can you explain, like, like, could you just kind of shell it up for us, like we're fifth graders basically, and just say, like, like what does it mean this cookie list world? What will it affect? Why does it matter? Why is it so hard? Sure. So it's it's all really just about. I know that was like five questions in one. <laughs> yeah, it's we'll, we'll we'll chop it up as best we can. So it, it's really just comes down to what is called interest-based advertising. And at the crux of this cookie issue uh, is user privacy. So if you've been on the internet, like pretty much every person in you know the modern world in the last couple of years, you see this little bar that pops up at every website that you go to, accept all cookies or deny all cookies. That just means that you're you know opting in to let people know that you visited that website. And whatever interests, you know, a company visiting that website are appended to your profile. That's what basically makes, you know, the internet free. Because as a publisher, which is a website, uh, I can then see that, you know, you've gone and shopped for a car. Um, You've also looked at new floor mats. um, And you've also looked at golf clubs. So if I'm Callaway, I want to serve you an ad on the website that I'm at because I think you might buy my golf clubs. Or I'm Ford and I know you're in the market for a pickup truck. Um, and those cookies that follow you along on the articles that you're reading, the website that you've been help build that profile that makes you appealing to advertisers, which is why you can roam the web for free um, because they have a profile that they can sell to advertisers and make money off of. And if they don't, they got to make money off you some other way um, because, you know, they're, they're not charities. Uh, so that's so, interest based advertising and cookies in a nutshell, I guess. So then Ford would then buy. The, so how does Ford get access to that data? They yeah. So, from- you know. Uh, uh, any number of, you know, first and third party data providers, right? Uh, Ford's going to always want to know, you know, who's pulling Carfax on pickup trucks. And, you know, I'm sure Carfax is willing to turn around and sell that to Ford's agency so that they can build a, you know, a first party data profile or third party data profile on those folks. And then other folks that just, you know, log on to Auto Trader 
um, or, you know, auto magazine and just look five best pickups of 2023 and Ford's in the business of selling pickups. And if I'm reading about the best pickups for 2023, it's probably time to whack Alex over the head with a gnat. Um, and that is all just set through, as you know, campaign management within platforms and interest-based targeting, right? Auto and tender, you know, household income in this, you know, part geo of the world so that, you know, I'm not getting an advertisement here in Maryland for John Elway's Manhattan Beach Toyota, um, you know, or his Manhattan Beach Ford. I'm getting it for, you know, Bob Bell in Maryland or Dar Cars or whatever the, you know, um, specific regional or hyper localized advertiser would be. Um, yeah. And then Ford, you know, at a higher level, um, you know, we could go deep into auto advertising. There's tier one, which is Ford commercial we see on Sunday. There's tier two, which is the regional auto dealers. And then there's tier three, which is the specific auto dealer that I might be able to go to within a five minute drive. Uh, and Ford has an interest in all those advertisers, all those, all those buckets working well so that they can continue to stave off Toyota, Nissan, Infinity, um, and the like. Um, and that's, that's really it in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah, I really got one big secret that has been kind of the guiding principle of of how I've worked for years now, and it's that Google, Facebook, and all of the other ad marketplaces are trying to automate your job away, and that's a good thing. They're trying to automate your job, and it's a good thing. So that's a counterintuitive statement. Add some color to that for me if you could. Yeah. So to unpack that, I think there's really that's it's good for two different reasons. And it depends on where you are in your career. If you've been in digital for a while, that's that you really understand what Google is automating. For instance, Google's my main channel. So I'm probably going to just say Google a lot when I mean all of the search engines, uh, yeah. all of the different ad platforms. But uh, Google's really the most advanced. So if, if you have a lot of experience in Google, if you've been working in paid search for a long time, You've seen it time and again. They've expanded match types. They've expanded their yeah. uh, their bidding strategies and all of these different things that we used to have control over. They've taken away, and and yeah. intuitively that seems really bad, right? It it makes it harder to differentiate yourself. But really, in reality, what you see is if if you kind of are have been around since before those automations went into place. You understand what they're doing, and so you can understand where they're doing it right, where it wins, and where they're doing yeah. it wrong and kind of exploit some of the, the seams and the wrinkles in some of their automation, some of their tools, um, and not just say, oh, target ROAS sounds great, I'm gonna turn that on, but right. actually know how to use it in a really effective way uh, and know when not to use it, which yeah. is often even more important. So for folks that aren't necessarily Google Ads experts, it used to be that you could just bid on a keyword with an exact match and Google would just show your ad as promised when the keyword matched exactly. These days, even when you do the exact match syntax, like with the brackets around the keyword, it takes a, Google takes a lot of latitude over like close variance, right? Like Ton. Google, like it's almost impossible to do a, an exact match. So I think that's uh, what Curtis is referring to is things like that. And that's just one of many, many examples. So that sounds overall, Curtis, like a bad thing. But you said it was kind of a good thing. Like, where's the good in this? Yeah, so the, it's complicated. It depends on if you are more experienced or less experienced. And there's good for both camps in here. So most marketing folks fall into one of two categories when it comes to the automations that search engines or marketplaces put into place. They either are blindly accepting of them and they just use whatever the best practices that Google or Facebook or YouTube or whoever recommends, um, and they get suboptimal performance from that. Decent, not exceptional. Other people have fallen into the camp of really micromanaging every single detail because that used to be the way to win in paid search and Facebook and these different channels. You used to have such granular control uh, that you could just kind of brute force your way into a really successful marketing campaign. Yeah. Today, there's so much machine learning augmenting your campaigns that if you just try to do it all off your gut and your muscle, 
you're going to actually be fighting against Google or fighting against Facebook and getting suboptimal performance. Yeah, so, so there's a camp of like, let Google do it for you. Great. Like, that sounds right. great. I'll bid more Google. Like, you know what you're doing. And there's a camp of like, nope, Google's out there to steal your money. Like, I'm doing everything manually. Right. And more experienced folks tend to fall into that latter camp, while new folks tend to fall into the premium, uh, the primary, the first camp, right? Totally. Uh, so the advantage, if you're an experienced marketer, is do accept some of these automations. Do accept that Google and Facebook and all these companies have the best engineers in the world working to automate your job, and they're going to beat you at some things. Yeah. Um, but they don't know the ins and outs of your business. And so you still have to do some things, which is what a lot of newer marketers will fall into is there's this good t row as I'm just going to turn it on and tell Google I want to make two bucks for every dollar I put in. It's going to be under-optimized. And so if you're new, look for those seams in your data where you can tell Google is doing something it shouldn't because Google doesn't have the business context that you have on your accounts. That was a keyword right there. Look for the seams in your data where Google's doing something that they shouldn't because they don't have the business context. So what you just described, I think, is a concept that we call broad with guardrails, right? Broad with guardrails. And that applies very much to both Google and Meta, Facebook, Insta, whatever. They're all constantly saying, go broad, go broad, go broad. Let us do it. Let us do it. Let us do it. And they're quietly saying, like, provide us the business context, like funnel your data back to us, basically, yeah. right? But they're not saying it that loudly, though they are kind of like the Google reps and the meta reps are, but they're super loud with like broad, 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 let yeah. us do it. Um. So we call it broad with guardrails. I figure you know what that means, but I want to know how you go about doing that or what's your advice to the listeners that are saying like, okay, great. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Google wants us to go broad. My gut's telling me to keep it micro and granular. Like, what do I do? Yeah. So there's a bunch of things. I, I think I, I like the broad with guardrails framework. I think that is probably a term I'm going to start using if you don't mind. But uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, there's a few things. One is is Google and Facebook. They have these tools, and these tools are going to do best if you do give it really accurate data. Uh, so first and foremost, make sure you create that feedback loop for Google and Facebook. Right? They don't have the business context, but they are really good with data. And so if you can, if you're providing them the wrong data, you're going to get you know garbage in, garbage out. So first and foremost, make sure that doesn't happen. I'll be happy like uh, to elaborate and like to your point. I think that the problem we have in marketing is that 9% 9, 9 of marketing or ads is just noise. So you want to get outside of that. You want to have people uh, notice you, especially if you market to them, you know, on like LinkedIn or even, even Facebook. Like you're competing with their friends and colleagues and uh, politicians they're interested in or influencers they follow. You have to do something that is remarkable, that's different, that's interesting. So for example, like in our uh, data reels, uh, LinkedIn page, uh, you know, it used to be just like boring things about, you know, features in our product uh, or yeah. general things highlighting, I don't know, people in a, a company or like who we're hiring, like what kind of positions we're hiring for. We exchanged that. We created like a media company within uh, data reels and we generate content like two posts per day. It can be funny memes about finance. Yes, FBNA professionals have a sense of humor. It can be sharing and highlighting you know, what influencers are posting about uh, the world of FBNA with like cheat sheets about accounting and FBNA and best practices. We we're talking about different uh, FBNA leaders that were able to really change the uh, the direction of their companies, even Amazon Prime, I don't know if you know, like was actually started by, by uh, someone that was leading their FPNA at Amazon. And uh, yeah, like one of the examples I show, shared with you before is like we just uh, posted, again, we do it on a regular basis. Sometimes it flops, sometimes it, it succeeds. We did like this funny meme, this short video of like FPNA going like through the mud, like a truck. Again, you have to follow our channel to understand it. 
Well, I have to share that because some people yeah. will be watching this on video, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll share it for them. Uh, and then I'll just describe it for the people that are on audio. But, uh, but this, this is just brilliant. I mean, yeah, like we got like thousands of like hundreds of comments, dozens of shares and like people are sharing it, talking about it, really enjoying it, showing and commenting, noting, you know, mentioning their friends. And like, again, we're a B2B startup, a LinkedIn page. Yeah, let's, let's see it. So can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So this is the ad and this, for people on audio, this looks like a monster truck. It looks like a monster truck getting ready to drive into this ditch, which is filled with water. And on top of the monster truck are the spectators. So it's like people, I guess, taking a ride on a monster truck and they're slowly. So, oh, and what is that Titanic music in the background? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to get the music in the background, but yeah, there's like a Titanic music. So it's the Titanic music in the background, the near, far, wherever you are. And then, oh my God, it's so funny. Like the visual. So it's these excited, you know, these excited party goers on top of a monster truck, expecting a ride in this monster truck. And they're in this water and they're just like slowly sinking and sinking deeper and deeper. The camera zooms out and it shows the, uh, the the people as the budget and the fpna software oh the reforecast reforecast it's so good it's just too good sorry i know that wasn't the best for for the listeners but um that's that's incentive go go grab the video of this you can find it on the site or uh or probably on linkedin we'll definitely share that little snippet with you on linkedin but that's so good like and oh by the way so data rails has 20,000 followers, uh, organic followers on LinkedIn, just to give you a sense. And that particular post generated at this point, 2,300, uh, likes 77 comments and 162 reposts. Right. But like, how do you come up with that? Like, like, like who, like, just tell us like, where does that come from? with the titanic uh, yeah. music like who comes up with that starting with that we have like a great marketing team actually like all of our linkedin efforts are led by our director of uh, brand and communication his name is jonathan marciano and uh yeah like uh, even the fact that we got to like twenty thousand followers is it's amazing again we're a startup of a hundred and something you know employees and we just surpassed companies with thousands of employees that are our competitors in terms of followers and we're trying to do you know, just fun and engaging and interesting, thought-provoking content on our page. And like I mentioned before, the goal is to be a media company. Our goal is to have people follow our LinkedIn page. Yeah, they well, we want them to check out our content. Looking forward, you know, to the next piece of content. So I gotta encourage all of you if you want to check out our page. Even if you're not an FPNA, maybe you can get uh, inspired and get some uh, ideas. So, and, uh, but most of the work here, I'll attribute to Jonathan Marciano for my team. So as of right now, I mean, TikTok is surpassed Facebook. It surpassed Instagram as the most time on platform. And in 2022, they're, <clears throat> they're forecasting to for users to spend on average 38 minutes. And I mean, the biggest thing that stood out to me, I was research, I was reading a study by Neuro Insights. TikTok outperforms all other social media platforms and approach and engagement responses. So what are those? Approach correlates with likability and like spontaneous in the moment action. So an unplanned purchase, you know, filling out a form to get more information about a product. And uh, TikTok was shown to be 44% stronger than other social media platforms on average in this department. The other thing that stood out was engagement which quantifies personal relevance of the content people are shown. And mostly it correlates with memory and retention of content. So this helps us predict like in the future, how people are gonna like future buying and decision-making processes. So people see a product on TikTok, then they go to, you know, Kmart or whatever, 
down, you know, two weeks later and see the same product on the shelf and they decide to buy it. So in this category, TikTok was 15% stronger than other platforms. The other thing is, I mean, cheap CPMs. I mean, I saw four to $12 CPMs, you know, I'm sure it's a little higher, you know, depending on vertical. Um, <clears throat> so, and Ben, I'm TikTok, sorry to interrupt you, but what is that? How does that compare to other channels? Like how does that compare to Facebook or LinkedIn CPM wise? On Facebook and lead gen, I'd be, I'd be ecstatic if I saw, you know, 15 to $25 CPMs, I'd be jumping for joy. So more than double basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah in some cases it's triple. So, so, so TikTok has more engaged traffic. That's more likely to approach. They're spending more time on the platform and you can get in front of them for half the cost basically. And they're spending more money. And they're spending more money. Have you been on TikTok personally? Have you ever been on the platform or used it? So I have as well, but I've, I have to limit myself. It's like super addictive, like going on there. It's like hard. It's like literally hard to get off. And there, um, so usually I go on there for work purposes only, but I definitely like, it is very just compelling and catchy. Like it, yeah. and it looks like most of you have already been on it. So, you know, all right, back to you. So that, that also kind of feeds into why TikTok works so well. Their algorithm is super, super, super good at predicting what type of content you'll like. So if you're into cars, I'm into cars. So naturally I, you know, engage and watch one of the factors that TikTok looks at is actually whether or not you watch a video for specific hashtags toward to the end, whether you like it, what type of creators you engage with. And it continues to show you videos in that specific community and they call it, you know, car talk or mechanic talk, whatever the, you know, specific talk community may be. And this also kind of allows us to hyper target, you know, hyper-target ads to specific hashtags and niches as well. I mean, and because of this, we're showing people ads they want to see, ads they want to engage with, products they, you know, might have a need for. This also leads to like a 23% higher detail memory than like TV ads or, e and I believe it was 15% higher than Google. So it's, it just works. Wow. So it's like sticky at like, like sticks in people's brains more strongly and it gets them to act, you know, more readily, which is, which is wild. Um, so, so that's on, uh, one actually tactical question, um, Jack asked, asked, how do we know what constitutes an impression on TikTok? So for running ads, is that like a half second or something like that? Like how does TikTok measure that? It is a six second view. I believe that's what they factor as an impression. Six second view. Interesting. Gotcha. Which is, that's higher than, I think Facebook's three seconds, isn't it? Yeah, I believe so. It is three seconds actually. Yeah. So. So yeah, so that's, that's fascinating. So, so what are some things you mentioned, some things that are fundamentally different in terms of the value proposition of TikTok as like a, um, a, an advertiser, how is TikTok fundamentally different? And are there some similarities with other platforms? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely similarities with other platforms in terms of the ads dashboard, but as an environment, as a user environment, if Sandy Hawkins from, which was, is the head of advertising for the U.S. Department of TikTok, she put it best. I mean, it was people check Facebook, but they watch TikTok. So that just tells you everything. Like you check Facebook, you scroll through for however long. But when you go on TikTok, like Chris mentioned, you're engaged, you're stuck to it because they're showing you things you want to see. So that's kind of like the, the biggest thing in terms of the environment, uh, in terms of how the ads appear, they appear the best performing ads appear more native to the platform. You know, like, let's say it's a product, it's more so I'm reviewing a product or saying, Hey, I just bought this or TikTok made me buy it is the most recent hashtag trend where people are like reviewing products they saw on TikTok. And then as a business, you can feed off of this organic traffic and just continue to promote to hashtags that are regarding your product. And that's a wrap. 
Thanks for joining us here today. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at revenuedrivencmo.com. That's revenuedrivencmo.com. And hey, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, Web Mechanics will do 10 to 20 hours of work for you for free. Literally no sales calls, no BS. Just give them a problem and they will put a team to work for you for free for 10 to 20 hours. Even if you're already a client, if you're struggling with demand gen, lead gen, SEO, SEM, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, conversion optimization, if you can't get Facebook or meta ads to work for the life of you, or you can't figure out attribution, web mechanics will take a good hard look at whatever problem you give them, whatever programs you put in front of them, and they will give you an objective informed opinion, plus some advice from 10 to 20 hours of senior level attention. And that's just because you're a listener of this podcast. So I would suggest take them up on this offer. It's ridiculous. Go to revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, fill out the two minute form and you will not regret it. Literally zero downside, unlimited potential for growth. So do yourself a favor, revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, no hyphens, no punctuations. You will be happy about that decision.